Thank you. Well, good evening and welcome. I can't believe that it's August already. Where did, where did the summer go? A couple of weeks, we'll be back in school doing what we like to do best of all. Is the, has the meeting been posted, Sue? Yes, it has. Okay. Sue is um, replacing our secretary because she um, isn't here today, so Sue is going to be our secretary for the day. Thank you for that, Sue. Are there any citizens that would like to address the board? Okay, see none. Then we'll approve the minutes. Could uh, we have a motion to approve Promote. the minutes? Okay, so moved and seconded to approve the minutes from the June 6th meeting. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, our first order of business is bright lights. We love bright lights. <laughs> <laughs> so come share with us. Okay, good evening. Um, my name is Dee Garcia, as you know, and tonight we are here with uh, Melanie Foreman, who is the South Guidance Counselor, um, Gina Nordham at the end, who is a South staff member as well, and students Megan Coons, Matt Held, and Cassandra Hernandez. Um, this entire team with a bunch of other students and teachers had the real benefit and pleasure of going to Spain, Italy, and Greece this summer for a travel um, and educational experience trip. And you can remember about a year ago, um, we started our, our foray or our path on global education. And these students really embody what it means to um, identify your own and others' perspectives, to investigate the world, to take action, and to communicate with diverse audiences. And they're here tonight to share their experience. Um, I think we're ready to go. We're going to start with a short video, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers from you all. Hopefully it's not too long for all of you. <laughs> Typically as a song. Well, as you can see already from the photos, the students had a variety <laughs> of um, interesting experiences in the communities, both um, starting from the time they left home. <laughs> great. The song is a rusted root. Uh, send me on my way. <laughs> okay, so Melanie's just going to narrate through oh boy. the slides. Impromptu narrating. Okay, so I experiential learning with a global sense lens. <laughs> And I'll highlight this as well because we did talk a lot about global learning and what it means to us. So we, we in how we could summarize it would be exactly what the district looks at it is investigating the world, uh, learning to communicate with the diverse audiences. So that started even before we went on the trip just by practicing and then recognizing perspectives that are different than our own. So, you know, sometimes you just don't know until you go. So a lot of the students were able to really just get there and, and even from the moment that we weren't able to take off on our first day and, and we were stuck in Chicago, they, they learned and understood, even in Chicago, that it was, you know, this is the start of a really wonderful experience of, of being open-minded and flexible. So we'll kind of navigate through these photos. This is in uh, Ponte Vecchio. 
Italy mm -hmm. here. There's too many to share, so it will go pretty quickly, but you'll just see a lot of camaraderie and rapport building. We were able to um, see the, the deck of the captain's deck of the ship that we tra traveled on, Barcelona. We did travel with um, two other groups from around the country, North Carolina and California. So we, the students, they, we were able to meet various students from all over our own country and many others, but they'll be able to share that. Capturing only about a hundred of the thousand photos that we all took. <laughs> we had a wonderful tour guide. She spoke six different languages, and um, she just from one country to the next was able to navigate incredibly and, and really teach us about her own travels and, and all the students that she's able to meet. The donkeys you see there was a city that we visited in Greece uh, who did not, they did not have any transportation other than donkeys. So uh, Mrs. Nordrum was a little surprised when she saw a refrigerator being placed on the back of a donkey yeah. and to be taken up the mountain. <laughs> so a little bit of eye-opening experience for everybody. Lots of historical information. Luckily, uh, Mr. Murtis, who is not able to be with us this evening, did go with us as well. He has a 103 temperature, so he has the flu right now, unfortunately, so otherwise he would love to be here. Uh, these are some of our students uh, dancing with a group of students who were there from Spain that they all met in Italy. So they met and spoke languages with each other, different languages with each other, and they were able to practice their own Spanish uh, language that they're learning. So that was a wonderful experience that they'll also be able to share. We were lucky enough that the group, um, travel group, added on Rome for a day. So the students were supposed to only have two days in Florence, but luckily we said, hey, let's all travel together and take a day in Rome instead and see some of the historical places that we've learned about. Um, that's La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, a church that is still under construction. That's Barcelona. This is our way back. Everybody is much more close in the back of the van as they <laughs> before we left. <laughs> Saw many animals, and that was them hovering around an animal again because it was the number one thing I think everybody would run to. And they <laughs> Mr. Murtis, I think, was more beside himself than most students. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the view from our hotel of um, the Parthenon. The night in Chicago when they didn't eat dinner until 11.30 at night in my room. <laughs> Flexibility. Our travel group would plan out every day for us so we kind of knew what to prepare mentally and, and to pack our bags with for the day if we were not to return to the hotel. Swimming in the Mediterranean. This is returning home. <laughs> I really had a great song in there, darn it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. That was all from the video. So we'd like to open up to questions from you all um, and some of the benefits that the students um, gleaned in terms of their preparation for this trip and then during their trip and now their reflection and what they'll take away. All right, I'll go first. Up. Years ago, when Mrs. Truog was a Spanish teacher at South, she did a trip to Spain, and I went along. So I know that some of what you've seen is phenomenal and wonderful. And it amazes me that here in the United States, we knock down houses that are less than 100 years old, and then you go to Europe, and what do you see? 600-year-old buildings in use. It just, it just amazes me. So we've got a lot to learn from uh, each other. So I'd like to have each one of you, if possible, tell me what was the highlight of your trip. Good job, Cass. OK. So I think that, um, as I was saying before, the first time, our very first experience in Europe was that night when we were in the taxi going to our hotel in Greece, and I noticed the street signs. And the street signs in Greece have the road in Greek, then in Spanish, and then in English. And it just opened up my eyes to how much other countries really accommodate for other languages. Mm -hmm. And it made me a lot more comfortable knowing 
right. that I would be able to understand. And then one more experience I had was in Italy. We were, um, when Miss Foreman was talking about the video of us dancing, that night we met um, another high school group that was actually from Spain that was also traveling around Europe. And we immediately hit it off with them. We just, it was amazing. I, um, we all hopped into the pool with them. And um, I met this one girl that is 17 as well. And she spoke to me in English so that I could understand her. And I spoke to her in Spanish so that she could understand me because our languages were about equal. And so I thought that was something that I really liked a lot. That's one of my favorite memories. Did you find that um, <clears throat> in the countries you visited that the kids all learned to speak English? Yes, mm -hmm. most of them, yeah. Wouldn't that be nice if, he, if yeah. we all graduated with the ability to speak two languages? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, so I think kind of like throughout what I noticed was just the the buildings were just beautiful and mm -hmm. just the architecture that was used and the cultures that were within everything and just how friendly and welcoming everyone was when we went no matter if we were looking at some souvenir or we were getting something to eat it just everyone was so friendly and they were willing to help you out and they just wanted you to explore the culture and that was one of my big takeaways for all of it do you think we americans um do that for when foreigners come to our country i would say less than they would do less. it there for sure okay yeah why do you think that is? What do you think? They have a little different kind of moral on how they go out through their day, things like that. Um, I think that's a little different. They're a little more open and kind. We're a little more rushed sometimes with certain things. So Very true. I feel like that's, a, that's definitely a big thing with it. Thank you. Um, so um, my favorite things in the trip were seeing like Pisa and the Coliseum, but also one experience that one experience that I had with actually Miss Nordrum was just kind of trying to navigate the public transportation system. Oh, yes. And we actually made a couple mistakes and ended up past our hotel by like 20 minutes. But we just had to. Them go by. <laughs> <laughs> we did. And um, we had to uh, talk to some of the locals and get our way back. And the taxis were on strike, ironically, so we couldn't really? take a taxi. <laughs> yeah. And we had to talk to someone who spoke English, thankfully, and she helped us get on a bus. And then on the bus, we found more English speakers who were voluntarily helping us to get back to our hotel. And it was just a really eye-opening experience that people out there are a lot kinder than they can be here sometimes. I will add to that. Um, one of the other girls who was not able to join us tonight, she's working this evening, but she did share, Molly is her name, and she did share that she felt that when she was going through that situation, um, she not only realized how much she didn't know, she's taken two years of Spanish, and we've all kind of shared how when you're on the spot, it, it's overwhelming to think of everything you've learned, but even more, she was excited to learn more, and I thought that was that natural application, that, that real world application maybe influenced her to want to take, quite often as a counselor I'm asked, should I take two or four years of a foreign language? And I think, are you only doing it for the college piece? Because to me, it's more than that. You know, it's, it's expanding on the, the language and the culture and the experiential learning that comes from it. So I thought that was a very cool experience to share because she just was so, you could just see, she was so excited about having gone through that and it wasn't planned. And that, mm -hmm. that open-mindedness was, was pretty incredible. Um, yeah, yeah. That one thing that Molly said that I was <laughs> very pleased to hear, she said, I can't wait to get back to school to tell Mr. Alvarez that I use my Spanish. Oh, yes. oh. <laughs> and I think that spoke tons to you know our teachers here and what they're instilling in our kids, not just learning that Spanish, but knowing they can do it. And she felt so positive. It was great to hear when yeah. she said that. Okay. Any other questions? I Okay, Mr. Bumgar. This, this will be for either Melanie or Dee. Uh, how many kids did you have with you? We took 15 total students. We started originally with 30 who wanted to go, um, and this was a year and a half in the making. So first of all, I want to thank all of you because you approved us to be able to go. <laughs> uh, the students knew that we were definitely um, that was something we had to have first. But along the way, there was a lot of fundraising that happened and budgeting that needed to happen. And I think, um, as some of the students had mentioned, the 
the price you can get for what we were able to go up on for student travel was wonderful, but it's still expensive. So I, I guess that is really what my question yeah. is about. One of the things we struggle with in our work here in the board is the cost of these experiences and the number of kids that maybe can't go mm -hmm. because of that. And I guess, where do you where do you feel that was? I mean, did you mm -hmm. lose kids just because of the mm -hmm. fact that they could Absolutely. not afford to do this? I would say about 50% of our students who wanted to go were not able to afford it themselves. So they had budget plans that we worked through. Um, and I think, you know, you, this is our, we're in the infancy stages of building this program for the entire school. A lot of times, as you know, it's been with foreign languages that the students have been able to go on the trips. But I think when, when you haven't been in one, you have this opportunity. So along the way, to answer your question, um, the only students that backed out who couldn't financially handle it were um, in, a, in a family situation that didn't allow them to. I had quite a few, um, whether they were moving or not a part of our, our district anymore, but um, I was very excited to see if the ones that really wanted it did it. They, they budgeted, they knew ahead of time, well enough in advance, that they had to make this much amount each month and fundraise. We had quite a few fundraisers that we had within the school and outside of the school. Um, and then work, you know, so they were really, um, if, if it's, I, we talked and communicated the entire time to make sure that they were able to do that because I knew that was going to be a huge barrier right away. It was something I had talked about with the company from the very beginning because, you know, these things sometimes they have a business to run as well, but I'm very clear and upfront to say, these are my students. This is what we have students from all different backgrounds, but first and foremost, they, they are a student who needs to learn to budget. So, you know. Yeah, what's that? Lexi worked like crazy. For mm -hmm. that. I know that. Exactly. There so, what did she say? Uh, one of the students, go ahead. Um, I know one of the students, um, she actually became my friend after this. Um, she worked like crazy uh -huh. before coming to this because her fam, um, their family situations who didn't allow like her parents to help she, her with it, so she, she helped herself. And I thought that was really great. And one of the bigger things with that, that I made sure the students knew from the get-go, even if you're working for this, this is not your priority. Your priority is as a student. So, you know, it, I would keep up on attendance and grades, and there were a couple, that was another reason why we lost a couple, was their grades and their attendance. So I had to ask them to back out. And I would speak with the trip coordinators, and they would allow for full refund, but, you know, that when you sign up, there is a the um, non-refundables sometimes so that I did make that sure that that was okay because sometimes students just don't know until it's too late and so that real world application again is coming in and I had a lot of students who were able to stay and I didn't have to worry about that so great well, question. It, it, you've, you've answered some of our concerns um, and I think you said that really nobody that really wanted to go was eliminated because of the lack of family funding. Mm -hmm. We were, we were able to find a way through the budgeting and the, and the fundraising. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. That's what I needed thank to you. know. Absolutely. Yes, Karen. Thank you. Cassie, um, did you keep in touch with the girl that you met? You I actually didn't. I never ended up keeping in touch with her, but we did keep in touch with some of the people. We became really good friends with the people from um, North Carolina that went with us, and that was... Um, so yeah, we still talk to some of them actually, but I really wish I would have. I just we never exchanged information. We were in the pool. We didn't That's really have. Phones. They put their phones down. So I yeah. Was <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. Yeah. Well, no wonder you had so many pictures. Every every yeah. student had a phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know what? In all the pictures, all I saw were smiles. It was from ear to ear. It was a lot of fun. Um, okay, so how? Are you treating people differently since you've come home? Like you said, your interaction, you know, we're so rushed here. How, is that, how has it changed how you view someone who may be from another country, maybe visiting? You're not even sure. How have you changed since you've been back? I feel like I'm a lot more interested in learning about their background than yeah. I was before. And um, I feel a lot more, I guess, open-minded about um, I don't know, just about everyone, not even just people from other countries. It's just, I loved that trip a lot. It changed my perspective on everything. Great. Anybody else? Yeah, I feel like being open-minded is one thing too, but just, you know, being there for them, understanding that we don't, 
like in other countries, we're not, not everything's translated yeah. here. So just helping when you see someone that maybe is traveling, doesn't know where they're going, just remember that you had that support there. They might not have it here. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think we all need to reflect on Very too. Very true. Good point. Um, one thing that I definitely noticed myself doing a lot more when I came back is when you see someone who looks like they might not really know what's going, like they're in a place that they're not familiar with, they need help. Like I find myself reaching out to them a lot more often if I know what's going on because being in Spain and like not knowing where I am, it was really like calming to have someone reach out to you and like help you. And so I find myself doing that a lot more to people once we returned. Um, I mean, it just, uh, okay, a few more questions, anyone? Um, how much did the trip cost? I don't remember anymore. It was uh, 30, 3,500, mm -hmm. wow. I would say. And, and really, truthfully, that's not the reality. I mean, the reality is they're going to spend a little bit more. You know, they're going to sp have spending money. Um, so we prepared. We had weekly meetings for a very long time, um, for about a year, I would say. And then we went down to biweekly meetings. Um, and a lot of those meetings were... How's the budgeting going? How's you know if you're if you're waiting too long to, to talk about it, then you're waiting too long to raise money. So we would try to make them. We were right after school. We've turned into a, a club at the school, um, the Global Travelers Club. So and a lot of that has been aligned with D and I being able to connect about dual language, um, and just bringing more students in who may not one find a place in the school anywhere, but um, two just the appreciation of of language spreading throughout mm -hmm. our district and in mm -hmm. our our little bubbles here in Waukesha. <laughs> I'm going to ask one more question if no one else is. What was your favorite country and why? Italy. Because I, um, well, that was where we had that really good experience in the hotel. So that also, that set it for me. But um, I just love the architecture in Italy. It was amazing. And the canals that we got to see. And just hit the history of it and walking around the streets it was just it was amazing were you in rome yeah we were in rome we were in florence and then we visited pisa and okay. just driving through other cities too Beautiful. yeah that's great i agree italy is, <laughs> I, I like italy yeah. too yes i mean i completely agree also with italy um i again a lot of the same things but just loved the the neighborhoods, the towns, just the small areas, that people, yeah, it's definitely something. Um, yeah, I completely agree with them. Um, my favorite actually was when we were in Greece and we went on the cruise around to the different islands. Oh, I just yes. loved every single island we were in. And I loved like just being able to like swim in the beautiful water and like see like the typical thing that you see in the postcard, like all the buildings just like up the side of like Mountains and hills, like I just loved it sure. too. No. One last question. Did anybody else have a question? Yes, go Mr. Ahead. Dietz. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to know. Um, oh, go ahead, Mr. Dietz. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to thank the staff people that were involved um, behind the scenes because obviously you've had some, um, given these students some life changing opportunities and also some memories that will last forever. So That's right. thank you very much for your commitment and your time. Uh, to make this event happen for these students and others that couldn't be here. Thanks for that. I just want to say it's it was life changing for me. We became a family. Sure you did. And I mean, we all just there's so many memories that just we know. And I hope too these a lot of these students I didn't know. Um, I hope that now they can come to me during school if they need anything or if they need to find a niche somewhere that they can come to us. So this was totally life-changing for me, too. So giving us this opportunity. Mr. Baumgart. Um, maybe a question again for administration. I don't mean to ignore you, kids. But <laughs> <laughs> things come into my brain. Um, was, were all of the students from South this year? Yes. And, and, and of mm -hmm. course, that, it's great because it's a highly diverse community that we have at South mm -hmm. as well. So that's important. But... Uh, did you know, do we have something similar in other high schools? Yeah. We do. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we were... We do. Actually, to draw attention to that, I know that uh, the counselor at West, Leslie Bruzo, she takes she took students to the Galapagos Islands, and um, her, right. next, her next plan is for, which she and I had spoken about teaming up with, um, 
just because we work with all different groups within the school, but uh, mm -hmm. service learning with uh, in a Peru. So oh. there's a potential. We're actually talking about the next trip, <laughs> hopefully. So wow. but we want to make sure that they're, you know, it's obviously spread to other students, but Thank yes, you. yes, definitely. And North, I think, has we've I've opened it up to everybody to be able to join. Any school can can join along with us, essentially. Thank so. you. Just just to show you how times have changed. <clears throat> when I went with South High School, it was fifteen hundred dollars for everything. Wow. And spending money. So times have changed mm -hmm. drastically. So have airlines. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's very, very expensive and but oh you're so lucky yeah. that you went you will never ever forget it. And you just brought all of my visits to Europe. <laughs> Dad, thank you so much. What a wonderful opportunity. Dee, did you go along with them? Oh unfortunately I did not. I would love to go, but Leslie Abruzzo She'll be on the next one. <laughs> Yeah, I would love to. Um, Leslie Abruzzo over at West has taken students to the Dominican Republic for service learning. She's gone to Ecuador, um, the Galapagos, and now, again, we're thinking about Peru. I would like to be able to go with the students and most of all with the staff to begin to cultivate more capacity around the district. Um, and we also have even younger learners, like eighth grade dual language students, who I think um, their families are really looking for an authentic experience uh -huh. outside of our local offerings Absolutely. to get their kids involved in seeing themselves as global citizens. You know, like Mr. Baumgart said, we can't thank the staff enough for providing you with that opportunity because without that school trip, you might not have gone to Europe ever because as you get older and you get married and you have family, you just don't have money for trips like that. So you're so lucky at the age you are at now to have seen that and giving you an idea how exciting it is in other countries. and. It was really a wonderful experience, wonderful. Just had a brief conversation about the bug that bites you when you put yourself into a different context. Absolutely. And so I asked all of the kids, like, well, now what next? You know, um, because you have the experience, it never leaves you. And for some of you, it will have significantly changed your lives. You don't know where your life will go. That's right. I know for me, there was a before and there was an after. Um, two separate people I became from my travel experiences. So I know this is just the beginning for them and for many other students. I'll just share a quick personal story because it, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I went to Austria on one of the trips to Europe and um, my grandmother was from Austria so I did some research before I left and I had a teacher at Hillcrest who wrote German and so she wrote to this woman that I was related to. And so a bunch of us teachers drove over the mountains all day and she welcomed, it was a cousin of mine, and she welcomed us in her home and said, welcome home, this is your home. And she went in the yard and she cut up a chicken <laughs> <laughs> and made a wonderful dinner for us. So I've, like you, I've had wonderful experience I'll never forget, and it just enriches your life. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing that to us and sharing that with us. It's fun for us to know about your experiences. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank it's our you. pleasure, thank you. Oh, I do, do you? Yep, we're going. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> um, we have an action item before us tonight. Uh, approval of 2017-2018 overnight field trips. Is there anything you'd like to add, sure, Jody? Uh no, I mean, these are not uh, quite the international trips that you've approved <laughs> in the past, but uh, pretty much in our backyard here, we're just looking at uh, Camp Whitcomb Mason for Butler, which will be an extraordinary experience, I'm sure, as well as the South Cross Country Wisconsin Rapids. So we're asking for your action approval this evening. Okay. Would someone um, <clears throat> make a motion to accept the um, uh, overnight field trips for Butler and South High School? I'll make the motion. Okay. Is there a second, please? Second. Second. Still so, a question. Yes. A bet. <laughs> Stacy. For Stacy. Oh. <laughs> you have a question, uh, Ms. No, Palmer? There's a, ter there's a term in here on the uh, uh, one from Butler. Uh, when they talk about what we're trying to accomplish here, they have the NGSS engineering standards. Do you know <laughs> what those are? National science. Next generation science standards. Next generation. Yes. Oh. 
Okay, well, that's good. We haven't caught up with the curve. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're just skipping over old, this Bill. one and going Come for on. the next. 20 years old. <laughs> okay. We're just skipping right over this one. <laughs> okay, we'll any, any we'll other there. comments, uh, questions? Okay. Um, then all those in favor? He's probably saying aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Okay, next we have. Um, some uh, information items. The first information item is environmental education update. Jody, take us into that, please. Sure, and those, those science standards are close to this young leader's heart. Um, I'm introducing Erica, who will uh, give like the that. presentation this morning, or uh, this evening. One second, I'll get connected. Welcome, thank you for being with us. So again, I'm Erica. I've been here in the past, but I did bring a couple of visitors with me, so I'll let them introduce themselves, themselves, and then I'll get started. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Matano. I'm the Solid Waste Supervisor with the county. I know, terrible job title. Uh, the reason I'm here is because I do chair the Departmental Environmental Education team as well. Uh, Joe Pite. I'm a faculty member at Carroll University in uh, Environmental Science and Chemistry. So if you remember, I was here uh, last fall. I had just taken over the environmental ed program for the district and I didn't really know what the heck I was doing. Um, but I was, I partnered with some really good people who knew what they were doing um, in our quest to kind of update uh, our program here in the district. So we just wanted to come and update you with where we are and what we're doing to, uh, with kids. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is we are actually getting some really amazing facilities upgrades at EB Shirts. Um, I've been told it'll be done by August 17th, so <laughs> fingers crossed. If you see Glenn, give him a little nudge from me. Um, we are actually, if you've been in the building, it was primarily used for storage and uh, I'm a teacher library. And what we're doing is that we're creating um, an entire science lab in there so that not only can we have students coming in there and working, but also collaboration for teachers um, and people in the city so that when science has a time to meet, that's where we go. Um, we have an amazing stream table coming for students to interact with, um, fully stocked lab stations, and we're updating all of the technology in there so that when students come, they can use their iPads um, for activities that make sense. We want kids to unplug when we're outside, but sometimes when you're collecting data and when you are doing big analysis, the technology can really help us. Um, we actually brought in plumbing and sinks, uh, which I learned bringing water in is not difficult, it's getting the water out. <laughs> but it's in and it's working, so we're really excited to finally have sinks. We always had to go to the bathroom to get water, so we are we are rocking with there. And we also um, received a grant from WEF to make a native garden. So we just had um, some students from Saratoga with their, um, their summer school come and help us plant um, about 500 different native species um, out there, not only to help for beautification, but to help bring in native pollinators um, to the area. So we're really excited about that project. And then when students come to our program in certain grades, they'll be interacting with that native garden as well. Um, our partnership with Carroll and Waukesha County um, has been going really well. We have actually completed kindergarten through fifth grade uh, curriculum rewrites. Uh, what we did is we wrote um, two-week integrated units uh, for the classroom teachers that wrap around experiences at EB Shirts um, and through county programs. And as we get to secondary, the Carroll uh, Prairie Springs program, um, we based them on the state and national standards for both science, math, reading, and environmental ed so that it's not something extra for teachers, it just blends into what they're doing. Uh, when we went through this curriculum process, we really wanted to make sure that we did it the right way. So we started out last fall with a focus group of teachers who taught science K-12, uh, figured out what they would want from an environmental education program. And then we, would, we brought in teachers from the school district of Waukesha, as well as our environmental ed teachers, and built um, the units, a, a K-1 group, a 2-3, and a 4-5. We did an internal review with our um, environmental ed program, and then we sent it out to teachers in different districts to do an external review process from, uh, for us. So we feel now we have a really good, solid curriculum, um, and we're gonna start piloting it this school year with our school district of Waukesha teachers. Um, if they, do, if they are willing to do the full in-depth pilot and do every single um, program activity, how it's written, 
Um, we're going to have some green school funds through the county to help pay for buses for them to come to Retzer and do the other programs besides what we provide here in the school district. Primarily for K-5? Kindergarten through fifth grade, yes. Secondary starting the process this school year. Uh, and then after that pilot's done, we'll take all the feedback from those teachers and do another internal review and just check where we're going. Our goal is to, you know, obviously update every year so that we don't get into the position where it's an older curriculum we have to revamp um, to the level that we did again this year. Uh, looking forward, we are really excited to start looking at partnering with other organizations. Um, how can we bring in La Casa Esperanza and some of their 4K programming? Um, and we want to bring in other area school districts. That's the ultimate goal of our partnership with county and, and the um, Carroll University is that we service School District of Waukesha kids really well, but we have a ton of other districts that are going to Milwaukee County or Washington County and other places when we have, a, a, we have sites here in Waukesha and we want to help um, bring environmental ed to them as well. And really the most important thing that we're trying to get is get kids outside. They Absolutely. spend too much time inside and we want them out there learning and appreciating so that they can become stewards of our environment. So that's, that's our update right now and you know, we welcome any questions that you have. Um, and one of your previous slides, you talked about an external review. You sent the materials to other other teachers and districts. So um, other teachers in the district. In other districts. Well, other so di uh, Kim Hofkamp, who works at Carroll University, does the teacher ed program and works with student teachers okay. and cooperating teachers. So she has a lot of connections with other teachers. So she was able to work with the dis teachers in like Kettle Marine or New Berlin and other districts. So they reviewed the curriculum. Is that a, is that a novel idea or, I mean, I, I'm not criticizing. I think it's very um, interesting. No, that's what you would see when you're building like something, um, like a textbook. You'd want other people besides you just do. you reading it. Um, because we want to put it out to people beyond school, the district of Waukesha, we wanted other viewpoints Thank besides you. our own. I like it. How did, I, I guess I, how do you, how are you going to integrate that in the high schools? That's the million dollar question. Uh, our goal is, so this fall we're going to start with 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Okay. And they're going to build um, a menu of offerings. So depending on what unit they want to come with, instead of every single 6th grader does this exact same trip, here's four different options that fit within your standards for science as well as environmental ed to give more flexible options, especially for our multi-age classes um, and things like that. We want to have kids coming out for longer periods of time, not just, you know, two hours, test the river and go back. Right. And what does that mean? Um, we want to get much more quality uh, programming. We're lucky enough that we have that planetarium out at Retzer that our students are going to already. What can they do when they're there at Retzer instead of taking the bus back right away? What, can, what kind of programming can they partner up with them as well? And for high school, that's where we'll, weigh, we'll really work heavily with Carol um, because they have the resources and the, and the knowledge to really ramp up our program because we don't have anything for 912 right now. Do you think that, uh, that you would move towards integrating it into a, a already existing curriculum or do you think you'll offer it as a new course? It'll be part of their existing curriculum. Okay. We actually already offer environmental um, studies courses at all the high schools. Okay. Um, but mm -hmm. we want kids experiencing this as part of their biology, part of their chemistry, and part of their physics, so they don't see it as something separate. It's just science. Well, my favorite thing is to get kids outside. You know, I live in a neighborhood that's very residential. Never see kids outside playing like I did. Perhaps many of us did. Kids don't play outside. They're probably in the house on... They're computers. <laughs> so thank you for making that important because um, we really need to do that. Mr. McCaffrey. Um, just a comment. I'm, I think it's great anytime that we're partnering with Carroll College, Carroll University. I just dated myself. Um, as everybody knows, I'm a very big fan of using them as a resource because I think that they have a lot of knowledge um, that can help us out. And I would also like to say they have some fantastic properties. Um, that we could use for our high school, I'm sure. that, And I speak from experience, I've been to them. Um, and they just offer a lot of different resources with those properties, so wow. very unique. Yeah, we're really excited. I mean, Prairie Springs is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted my EP shirt to look like that, but apparently yeah. we didn't get a million dollar endowment, right. so <laughs> we couldn't. But yeah, Patrick. it's wonderful. What? Hey, Patrick. Yeah, I can All work right, on I'll that. Work on it. <laughs> we'll Let's name see. the building after you. There, there you go. <laughs> 
Any other questions, comments? Good. Okay, well, thank you. That was very interesting, and I'm very proud of how much you've accomplished. Thank so you. keep it going. We want our kids to know about outside. Thank, thank you. Partners. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, very partners. Bit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, reading update. Yes, I have uh, Melissa ha Yao coming up here for our annual, uh, to meet sort of a state statute requirement, if you will, but we're always proud to give you an update on our reading assessment uh, information, and she'll be pulling that up to present to you this evening. Well, it's the summer. We shut it down in the summer. Looking to getting an old slide projector to make your stuff. Overheads. Let's get some overheads. An overhead? Overheads. <laughs> How about the, the, I the strips? Out. The strips that we call those um, film strips? Film strips. Oh, we all see right. those all the time. Good evening. And I'm here to um, present this evening an annual report on our reading achievement at the elementary level. So, um, we're going to start off with our youngest learners in the district, our students in 4K. And this graph represents all students in 4K. So our model one, two, and three sites from this year. So it includes Montessori, students at Head Start, as well as all of our site schools and our other partner sites. The green indicates the um, fall score, blue indicates where they're at at winter, and then yellow in spring. The assessment that you're looking at the results from right now is the, the PALS assessment, which is the phonological awareness screening that we use here in the district. We are required at the state for our 4K through second grade students to have an early literacy screener. And the state used to mandate that it was PALS, and they moved away and just said, you can select your own. And because it was an assessment that we thought was quality and our teachers already understood the assessment, we have stuck with it. Um, so the assessment really looks at all those early literacy skills that you need to help you build into becoming a complete reader. So at the 4K level, they look at things like rhyme awareness, beginning sounds, um, name writing, so writing their names. In almost every area, if you look and see, our students from the beginning of the year in 4K to the end had an average of 30% um, increase in their skills. So really something to celebrate what's happening across all of our learning areas in our 4K classrooms, a really exciting place um, to be. The next assessment is PALS again, and it's looking at our students in kindergarten, first, and, and second grade. So as you move up, the skills, of course, get more complex in reading. So as you go up second grade, score 77 is a little bit lower, and you get to second grade, one of the assessments is really putting all those skills together and they have a complete reading assessment where they have to read a passage and understand it as, as well. So we're continuing to see improvements in the area. Our last assessment that we use is MAP, which is the measure of um, academic progress. And this screen here will give you a four year look at how students in kinder through fifth grade have been doing in the area of reading. I really want to point out over the last um, two years, um, from 2015-16 to 2016-17. So this mirrors where we're at with um, our reading curriculum. We're in our second full year across the district. And so when you look from 15 to 2016, um, in each area, we are averaging a 2% increase um, from those years. If you look at the cohorts, we're also from, if you look at the students in 2015 over to where they're at in 2016, we're also averaging a 2% um, increase. So we want to continue to move students forward at the, at the grade level, but then also across um, the cohorts of, of students. How, Melissa, how many tests and five-year-olds get per year? For our students in 4K, 
Um, now they're just getting the um, the PALS assessment. It's about 5K, 5. 5K, we've been also looking, we're reducing again this year. We are going to be eliminating PALS in the area of reading because we have, I mean, we're going to be eliminating maps for our kindergartners and first graders in the area of reading because we have PALS and they really give us the same information and we need to reduce the assessments that we're giving. We also give um, running records and we're really looking at those being ongoing. We're just sitting down with the, the students when they are in guided reading and then we need to really dig into a student more doing the um, formal observation. So we're really we don't want to overassess kids. We really want to look at what are we, uh, the information that we're getting, how are we using it? And the bottom line is how is it helping us learn about the child to drive them forward where they're at and move them forward? So Thank you. we've done a lot at help at, um, over the past two years of really trying to reduce the assessments, but looking at the quality and what they are, they are giving us. So do the students do these tests on a computer? Or um, is it a paper test? The, PALS is um, a paper assessment, and so some of it is just orally given through the teacher. Some of it is written, and then the teachers go and enter it electronically. The MAP um, assessment is electronic at kinder and first grade. It speaks to them. They wear headphones, and it um, interacts that way. Second and above, they're reading and answering questions in different, different formats. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. It says all ethnic groups. Does yes. That, um, is that socioeconomic as well? Yes. That's that's, that's all the kids. That's e everyone. That's correct. That's everybody. That's every ethnic everybody groups. is represented in that percentage. So Melissa is everyone. Correct. It includes special education students as well. Okay. Oh, do you have something? Nope. More? Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I've got I've got some questions. Um, so you said they take the five K five kids take two tests a year. Um, we have reduced it to um, one time a year that is mandated by the district for maps. That it's just spring because we really look and compare spring to spring um, data for for students and their growth. So buildings do have the option if they are looking for more information to give a grade level, a group of students or individual student an assessment at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, or end of the year. Mm -hmm. There's also some other skill assessments that if they're needing to find some more in, um, information could give a student in between. Um, PALS gives the assessment so far students in literacy um, 4K, gives it three times a year kinder first and second they give it at the beginning of the year and the end there are a few students who you might have to give the assessment to at the middle of the year if they did not make the um, benchmark in fall because you're really wanting to stay close to what those students are understanding so a few students may have to have an assessment at the middle of the year Melissa do most of our k-5 kids come from a k-4 program not most. We are seeing an increase in the number of students because of the many opportunities they have yes. at um, sites within the district mm -hmm. and because of our relationships with our partner community schools. Mm -hmm. So therefore, um, it wouldn't be outrageous to, t to give them a test in K-5 if they've had something in K-4. But I, I like right. what you said. We should not be over-testing young children. We shouldn't. And the nice yeah. thing about um, the PALS assessment, it's the phonological awareness. So we're really assessing students. A lot of it is done orally where they are playing with rhyme and what do, what do they know, just beginning sounds. So it starts off with a lot of just understanding verbally with with words and letters and the sounds that they make, and then it moves on as they get to second grade. We were looking at phonics, so with print, how are these? Um, Do you sounds use looking? the reading recovery program in K five? Nope, reading recovery is just a first grade um, program. So we have to give students the opportunity <laughs> to um, learn before we begin inter intervening. Absolutely right. So. Well, that is really good news. Um, So they, they take them, 
they take the, the PALS test on a computer? No, the MAP test they take the on the computer. Okay. PALS okay. is um, orally given. Some of the assessments oh, okay. um, are on a, a sheet of paper where they have to okay. do some, some written pieces. Okay. All right. That was uh, important to me. Yes. Um, do these grades include eAchieve? Are they included in there? Um, no, eAchieve is not included in not this. Included. It's not included. Do they take the MAP test at these? Do you know what do you know what testing that we give them or I didn't because I know I don't mean I don't really know how many students we have in these grades in the achieve that's a good question I don't know the answer to that I do know that they assess students in e achieve but I couldn't tell you offhand right now which assessment that they give I do believe that they have access to map but I believe there were only about 30 elementary E-Achieve students. That would work. So okay. if the numbers yeah. were in there, it would be a very small percentage. So when you say 30, you mean in K-5? Yes, Correct. in our elementary program. Fifth grade. Thank you. And is, is, there, is there a reason, not to go too far afield, that we don't include them? They are students of the Washoe School. They are. District, correct? They may be included. Okay. In we, what okay. I'm they could be. I'm the not. The number would be so small. All right. Yeah. I was just wondering. The, okay. We've got, my... you know, approximately 6,000 students in yeah. the K through 5 level in Waukesha. Right. The e achieve contribution to that is pretty small. Is our ultimate district goal that all kids in K-5 read by the end of kindergarten? Is that Read by is the end of kindergarten? Um, well, our ultimate goal is that they're reading, that they're on grade level by the end of third grade. So... Um, as we know, students learn in different ways at different times. So right. we have to be very responsive to, mm -hmm. to each child and where they're at and how they're, they're growing. That's right. So some students come to us reading in kindergarten. Yes. Many students are reading. When they leave kindergarten, we have some who aren't, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're behind if they're not. They just, right. Right. It might, all the pieces might not have to come for them yet. And so... We meet them where they're at and continue to help them grow. So, because I would certainly think that that would be a goal for first grade that yes. all students should be reading by the end of first grade. Yes. But I guess I never held the uh, idea that all K students, because right. like you said, you know, their individual differences, their maturity level, um, the different experiences they've had all make a difference in learning how uh, to read. So, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. I wonder. I wonder if um, <laughs> you wrote the word PLAY on the board if they knew what that meant. <laughs> well, they're going to after this year, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Love to hear it. Thank you, Melissa. Thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. Um, summer school update. Yes. Yeah, so our last uh, item for this evening is Amy Rebel and the summer school update. Since we ended in July, I have exact data for you. There are 18 e achievers. Oh, good. Really? Wow. Thank you. That's perfect because Amy represents a yes, dual so role in, in our district with pulling that up. <laughs> and Dana. now I'm hoping that my computer works for the rest of the <laughs> well, well. director and shift, summer school. Welcome, Amy. Yes. Thank you. you. I'm excited to be here. Yes, we have new data dashboards with Wise Dash Local that we're able to pull up data like that. Very What's quickly. a dashboard? So, well, it is our um, way of pulling together multiple pieces of information. And I was able to go into our Wise Dash Local and um, look at eAchieve and Map and see um, what how the students performed last year. And I was able to do that while you guys were talking. So, so it's so it's a tool it's, that's used to show student progress, individual yes. student progress, individual student as well as school progress. Uh, that's and what I thought. So um, and those of us at the district level can look at it as a district as well. So. Come across that terminology yeah. recently, and yes. I know what is dashboards. Good, good. <laughs> Thank you. Certainly. All right. So I want to talk just briefly. I promise I'll be brief about summer school. But as you noted. Um, the regular school year is only a month away, so we are wrapping up our summer learning. Um, most of our summer has, has completed, and if you want a full um, array of pictures and um, quotes and information about the year, um, our summer school principals and teachers had a running hashtag of SDW Summer Learning. 
So um, you can go there and see all sorts of things on, on Twitter. Um, we had 10 summer learning locations where there was some kind of summer activity going on. Um, I noted our traditional summer school in quotes there, our um, traditional summer school sites of Blair, Butler, Hawthorne, Higher, and North had readiness and enrichment classes going on um, June 26th to July 21st. Um, East, um, throughout the summer, has had some students um, finishing up some credit recovery through um, using the online Play-Doh platform. And um, South and West have had um, strength and conditioning and summer band going on, and summer band is still going on now. And STEM Saratoga has had a variety of proficiency and um, enrichment classes going on Monday through Thursdays all throughout the summer. So a lot of different different things happening at those locations. For the first time this year, we had online learning as well. So we started a pilot this, um, this summer with as through eAchieve and the summer school office. So um, eAchieve had done a survey a while back of courses that people would be interested in for the online during the summer. And those are listed there. And so we selected those five classes and opened up enrollment for, for those classes. We capped each class at 29 and held pretty close to that. So we ended up with a total of 91 students participating. Their window, um, their summer school started a little bit early and ended a little bit later. So um, I will be able to see grades after tomorrow. So we'll see how, how everybody did. Final things are, are being graded. So I think we, um, it was great to have this option for students because we have some who really want that. Um, we had other students who really wanted the face-to-face, -face, so it was good to have some options for both. And um, we'll be taking some of the lessons we learned both about logistics and about how we can support students through this and how we make sure students are selecting carefully because sometimes an online class when you're thinking in May, oh, I can do online during the summer and then um, you kind of have to keep on pace and the weather gets warmer and there are other, other things you might want to do. So um, it's not the approach for everybody, but we are looking at um, kind of taking a look at what our lessons were that we learned and hopefully um, expanding for next year. So it was nice to be able to you have mean those this are option. all credit courses? Yes. Amy, I have to tell you how pleased I am to see this going on. I've got three families of grandchildren who've gone to three different school districts. And I want to tell you, in two of the school districts that you know are very highly touted as being the best, they don't offer anything for below average kids. And it's sad that those kids go year after year to school and don't realize any success. So here's another fine example of what we can do to help kids be as successful as possible. So I'm so proud of our district for providing Thank that you. opportunity. Yes, we have a lot of opportunities for kids to experience, yes, experience multiple things during the summer. Um, speaking of students' experiences, we had a number of students participate in um, summer school. So our total enrollment as of right now, and I think it'll grow a little higher as we get that summer marching band, those final numbers in, um, are 3,624 students experience, experiencing at least one summer school class. Some took, um, at elementary you can take three classes a day, um, at high school you can take two, and middle school you can take three as well. So some might just take one, others um, take, a, take a full load. That includes our online, and um, it doesn't, well I should say first of all that this um, program, with this number we have an increase of 400 students over last year. So um, that's like adding an elementary school. So yes, that was a, a, good, a good number. Um, we did have a couple of things this year that we did not offer. And one was we didn't have any environmental ed at EB Shirts because of the work that's going on this summer. But we hope to be able to offer that again in future years. And then with some changes in staff, we did not have a sixth grade summer band camp. Um, through um, summer school the way that we had the, in the past year. So, um, so despite that, we still were able to increase with 400 kids. So, so we were pleased about that, and principals were hiring, hiring more teachers and making sure they were utilizing their space well. So that was, that was a good thing. Um, number of enrichment courses, just I wanted you to see a sampling of, of what we offer. Um, several new classes listed in that. 
Um, we offer our teachers throughout the district an opportunity to propose courses, and then principals for summer school look back at previous courses that were successful and make some decisions about um, what classes they want to offer. And classes come about in a variety of ways. Um, I was talking with one of our summer school principals, and we were talking about how every class has a, has a curricular connection, and oftentimes parents are looking for classes where students can boost their skills over the summer, but they don't necessarily need the intensive nature of a, a readiness class. And I said, you know, if we had like a newspaper class where kids could keep writing. And somebody said, I really like that idea. And so at two of our sites, we had summer school newspapers this year. So um, at one site, I'll show you a sample of one, and at the other, I had to chuckle because it was the, the Hawthorne True News. So apparently, <laughs> <laughs> somebody had been hearing some things about fake news, so they made sure true theirs was news. true news. So um, throughout all of our classes, you're going to see that um, students are able to demonstrate proficiency on identified learning targets. We have quality small group instruction going on. Our elementary principals did some additional in-service with our literacy readiness teachers this year, so they made sure that there was a strong connection between what students were receiving in the summer um, to what they had received as a part of our comprehensive literacy model during the school year, so that was that was um, something new that we added that I think was a real, real benefit. Um, students are really getting the opportunity to, to explore new topics, as well as teachers getting to explore topics that they don't get to teach during the school year in those enrichment opportunities. So, and um, kids really do get to interact well with students from other schools. Um, I had a, a mom call concerned that her daughter wouldn't know anybody in her class. And, you know, that's obviously brings about some apprehension. And I started looking at some of the lists and I'm like, I think there are going to be a lot of kids in that same, that same boat. So uh, teachers do a nice job of building that community right from the beginning. But it is an opportunity for them to get to experience, experience and make some new friends. So I had asked um, Garrett Shesky, who was our principal at Blair, this was his first year in a summer school principal role, um, to come and share tonight. And he, he was so excited to get to share, and he emailed me this afternoon, and he had to email because he couldn't talk. So he was unable to, to join us this evening. But I want to just share a couple of highlights of things that, that they did at Blair this summer. Um, there we go. Let's see. They had 292 students. Garrett um, introduced seven new courses to the program, everything from cursive and codes, where the students learned cursive, but also practiced Morse code and sign language and some other, other pieces. There's a crocheting class, um, a playworks and playground games class that incorporated some of the playworks concepts that they're using during the school year, and a lyrics, literature, literature and poetry class. So. Um, Lots of lots of fun things happening. Garrett had a number of in-district teachers, and he also um, had more out-of-district teachers than we typically have at a school, but allowed um, some some new fresh fresh ideas into into the program at Blair as well. So, a um, couple of examples on the left there. That is the Can You Dig It class. And they were able to access um, the community garden that's nearby um, the Blair site. So they were able to partner with um, those organizers there. And that was a great success. And on the right, we have Project Give Back. And we talked a little bit about this one last year. This is a class that expanded to Blair this year. And the kids learn about community helpers and um, community leadership. and some of the nonprofit organizations we have around town, and they decided to do a fundraiser for Haas and Hebron House, and so they were able to give their from their little bake sale and lemonade stand, they shouldn't say little, because they were able to give $200 to each organization. So that was, and that was from selling right there on the playground before and after school, so. Literacy engagement at Blair, they um, had a creative drama class that wrote their own production and organized their costumes, designed and created the set, memorized their lines, so a lot of literacy and work, um, literacy and um, art working together there. And then on the right, that was the new class I mentioned, lyrics, literacy, and poetry. They took a look at literacy by studying the lyrics and music of famous musicians, such as Les Paul. So um, that was a class written by a teacher here in the district. And then finally, I mentioned the newspaper. Blair had um, two issues of their summer newspaper. So the students had um, different 
different um, tasks that they were assigned as far as different stories that they went out and um, learned about. Uh, there on the left, you can see that they interviewed their principal. They also um, did some classroom updates, what was happening during summer school as well, some other things that interested them. Um, I think one of those headlines says Brewers first in league, so there was some sports reporting as well. So um, kind of a fun way to get to exercise their writing skills over the summer. So, and that newspaper was then shared electronically with the Blair Summer School families, and each student got to take a copy home. So, um, that's kind of our update for this summer. We continue to look at things for next summer, how we can continue to grow these opportunities. I've been working with um, Sharp Literacy, the Parks and Recreation Department, even the Girl Scouts have reached out for um, to talk about how we might be able to incorporate some different things into summer school. So, we'll continue to look at that. Um, and I've got a team of eager elementary summer school principals who have already started on their plans for growing their curriculum during the school year. So I think we're going to see lots of things this fall that will benefit us next summer. Amy, this triggered my thinking here. Um, they obviously use technology to, to build that mm -hmm. newspaper. In the past, We've had the uh, iPads were not necessarily taken home during the summer. They could be returned, or they, there was some kind of a either or type of a situation based on the family. Or y yes, what are we doing? I mean, these kids must most of them must have had their iPads. They, with they them. did. We did ask that, um, and we ran into that situation a little bit last year. So we did ask that families that had. Um, that w had access to iPads that they, they they bring those with them and then check them in after summer school if, okay, if so, they wanted to so do they, that. So we yeah, we worked through the that. Okay, and you. then we have some students who attend summer school who are live within our attendance area but maybe attend a private school or another um, another option. And so we make sure that they get hooked up with an iPad as well so that they have access during the school year returning. or during the summer. And they do return them, yes. That was my yes. question. You know, do, do we have local private school students come to our summer school? We do. We have we have a number of them. Um, we also have um, people who pay tuition. We had just two this year. Um, that One is a family that um, they're open enrolling for this coming school year, but because they weren't in attendance this year, they um, were not eligible to attend for free. Um, so they were they were wanted to pay tuition so they could get involved in some of the oh. summer school courses. So that's great. So. And I should say about the iPads, some of the classes don't use the iPads, and so students don't don't need them. So um, teachers look at that pretty carefully and communicate with families about that before summer school starts. Any any other questions discussion? We do not. So yes, this is the that was the change. This is the second year that we have we have not had fees um, for summer school. Everything is everything is provided. So yeah. Well, I I'm sure that um, the kids that come have had a wonderful experience. They have had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's fun to see them even on that first day or the second day when they're tired. They're like they're right. they're excited about right. coming, and even on the last day, they thought it was thought it was pretty good. So. Is it an all homework summer school? <laughs> generally, at elementary and middle school, generally, yes. So I can't say the same for those high schoolers finishing up courses, though. Just trying to check. Yeah. And d they had uh, breakfast and lunch, right? Correct. We had um, breakfast and lunch again at um, Blair, Hire, Hawthorne, North, and Butler. So that is um, through DPI and the U.S. Department of Agriculture that we can apply for that program. And it's based on um, the attendance area um, free and reduced lunch population during the school year. So there are certain sites where we can offer that. And we did have a nice increase this year in our number of um, lunches being served every day. So uh, their average was like 500 a day. So the so, students didn't have to pay for lunch? No, anybody in the area, even if they're in the neighborhood, even if they weren't participating in summer school, could they come. could um, come to breakfast or lunch, anyone 18 oh. or under. And did you have many that did come? You know, we don't keep track okay. of that, but um, anecdotally I can say that um, definitely families that had younger children for, who, were, who weren't were participating in summer school but had siblings in summer yes, school yes. came in. Um, that was the majority, but there were a few that I would see walking in just for just for lunch. So that's a, a great option that we I, have. I don't think I've ever seen that in the budget. 
you know. No, that um, is all provided through that um, DPI grant. So it's wonderful, just wonderful. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Well, thank you, Amy. Okay, thank, thank you. you for this wonderful program. Thank you. Okay, and last but not least, student achievement update. And we don't have one this evening. I'm counting the reading assessment as our achievement update. We'll come back uh, as school starts again. We'll come back and uh, continue to highlight our school's progress as we did uh, this past school year. Okay, great. Okay, any other questions, comments? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you.